Hello, my name is Neville Bryant, and I'm a researcher in Linguistic Data Consortium, where, um, among other things, I've worked on benchmarking speaker diarization systems as part of the Die Hard Challenge. And today I will be reviewing the motivating forces behind that challenge, as well as the evolution of speaker diarization uh, systems on those Die Hard data sets over time. So first, uh, let's just start with some preliminaries. What do I mean when I refer to speaker diarization, So the, the short version of that is speaker diarization, is the task of determining who spoke when in a conversation. Uh, rather longer version, it's the process of partitioning a conversation into speaker homogeneous uh, speech segments, which said yet a third way is to take a recording, identify how many speakers are present on that recording, and for each speaker, identify all segments uh, of time during which that speaker is speaking. But perhaps really we should just you know, start with an example. <clears throat> so this is a short excerpt from an interview on Fresh Air. Let's just play this quickly. Did you get any royalties since you'd already sold the song? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Would you would you sing us a bit of the family Bible and tell us what went into the writing of it? Well, this is sort of autobiographical, or practically one hundred percent autobiographical. Right. So, white band recording, clean conditions, two speakers, limited overlap, not hard. And below is an ideal version of what a perfect transcript, of perfect diarization would look like. Two speaker turns by Terry Gross, two by Willie Nelson. Again, this is a reference output. This is not an actual system output. And why does why do we care about diarization? Well, uh, we could just care about it as because we care about speech recognition. So as a pre-processing step for automatic speech recognition, diarization would allow you to identify overlap regions as a byproduct. And of course, as we know, overlapped speech is particularly problematic for speech to sex text. So being able to identify, the, identify those regions and then handle the overlap especially would be useful. It also in the past has been used to enable speaker adaptive acoustic modeling. Uh, for instance, if we look into early work in speech or speaker diarization from the 1990s, it was used in this case, uh, particularly for broadcast news. We also might just want diarization in order to make the output of the speech to text system more useful for humans or for downstream tasks, uh, such as summarization or, or parsing or machine translation. Uh, this, this was the motivation behind the NIST rich transcription evaluations that ran between 2002 and 2009, actually. Or actually putting aside any <clears throat> uh, cross pollination with the rest of uh, ASR and speech technologies. It would just be useful in general to be able to automatically and accurately diarize large, large amounts of data, especially clinical data, which would enable automatic extraction of various purely phonetic parameters, for instance, characterizing the distribution of pitch or speech, non speech durations uh, within a population or subpopulation or even a single speaker. And this is not just like speculative. If we go back, uh, this is an excerpt from a paper from 2017 by Naomi Nevler that is examining various attempts to uh, approaches to automatic measurement of prosody and comparing the distribution of these features and these parameters within behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia patients and controls. If we look at the top part of this figure, we see a distribution of F0 range. Uh, for the controls versus behavioral var variant FTD patients, and they are quite strikingly different. Similarly, if we look at the bottom two figures, we see the distribution of mean speech segment durations and mean silent segment durations within those populations. Again, very distinct and notably different distributions, which is actually even more interesting is that within this particular uh, patient population, behavioral variant FTD, you're actually not really expecting to see striking speech characteristics. Or we could take a look at a 2016 paper on the use of speech technology and uh, human language technology in general to explore the <coughs> distribution of children on the autism spectrum. So here we're actually comparing three populations, uh, children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder 
children who are not diagnosed as ASD but have another linguistic impairment, and then the TDs, the typical developing controls. And children diagnosed with ASD speak significantly slower than the typically developing uh, counterparts and have a larger median absolute deviation from median F0. So diarization is of interest for multiple reasons, not just as preprocessing step for other speech, uh, <coughs> excuse me, other aspects of the speech pipeline. Having motivated the, the desire for some sort of useful diarization Let's just take a really brief, uh, let's just brief step back and just consider how we got to where we were in around 1990 to where we were right before Die Hard started around 2017. This is gonna be a whirlwind tour of diarization, research. Back in the 1990s, the, what little research there was tended to fo really focus on two domains, focused on air traffic control recordings and specifically isolating air traffic controllers from pilots in those recordings. Uh, this is work out of BBN in the early 90s. Or diarization of broadcast new recordings uh, for the purpose of then using those speaker labels to adapt acoustic models. Uh, this is from Hub 4 in the late 90s, that evaluation. <clears throat> Systems of this era had a three modules typically. There would be a speech activity detection module that would take the raw audio and output a series of speech segments, a change point detection module that would take the output of that SAD system, and then split those segments at uh, speaker change points to give you a, a set of speaker homogenous speech segments, typically using some distance uh, metric based on base information criterion. And then there would be clustering of the output of that change point detection module typically a glomerular hierarchical clustering with segment segment distances determined using a generalized likelihood ratio to base distance metric. And as I mentioned, there wasn't really a lot of this research. Uh, where we really started to see a big influx of research effort was in the early 2000s to mid 2000s, 2002 to 2009, which corresponded to the NIST rich transcription series, the RT series which was focused on enriching speech to text output with uh, additional metadata to make that output more useful for humans and downstream tasks. And so this could be things like disfluencies, uh, sentence, unit, sentence units, and of course, speaker labels. Eight of these evaluations include a speaker diarization component. The, the early the first couple of times that the evaluation was run, the focus was more on conversational telephone speech and broadcast news, but this shifted in the later years to be exclusively focused on the meeting domain. In addition to simply spurring effort in this area and research, this evaluation also introduced diarization error rate, which is, has remained a principal evaluation metric used in this field for nearly 20 years since. I mean, the RT series fostered lots of work. It led to substantial improvements in diarization, especially in that median domain. And just look at some of the advancements that occurred during this um, period 2009 to 2009. Introduction being forming from microphone array data in the median scenario. Uh, transition from unsupervised SAD systems to SAD systems uh, because the SAD, the supervised SAD systems were much better able to handle the more complex acoustic environments you found in the meetings. You had uh, new approaches to an automated determination of when to stop clustering. Of new approaches to segment representation using latent factors, uh, for instance, joint factor analysis, which is a precursor to I vectors, variational Bayes clustering as an alternative block hierarchical clustering, uh, approaches to resegmenting the output from the clustering step, specifically, specifically the Turby resegmentation. But after that evaluation series ended in 2009, there was an eight year period, 2009 to 2017, which I somewhat melodramatically labeled the wilderness years just to get a title, uh, where you did have a lot of work still. I mean, if you do searches in Google Scholar, you'll find quite a few papers being indexed during this period each year that involve diarization. And there were many clear advances in terms of the approach, the introduction of I vectors, the introduction were subsequent to that of uh, 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 X vectors, PLDA scoring, and various improvements to clustering. But there were no major 
evaluation is occurring with the diarization component. So there was this fragmentation of the research community where different groups would focus on different domains, different data sets. One group might be working on meeting speech from the AMI corpus, the AMI corpus, another group on conversational telephone speech from call home. There was a portion of call home that was annotated with uh, diarization labels for an older SRE. There'd be sometimes inconsistent evaluation procedures even for the same corpus. With the result, it's just difficult to really compare the system outputs during this period and really gauge progress. It was clear progress was being made, both in terms of the technology introduced and the impact effect on the technology. And it was clear that this was not a solved problem, but it wasn't really clear exactly where we stood. And to give an example of just how unsolved it was, despite there being uh, the entire focus of rich transcription was on diarization for meetings, having that during the NIST evaluation series, despite in the intervening eight years being interest in diarization for the meeting domain. The output of commercial diarization APIs in 2017 on the meeting domain was not good. In fact, it wasn't good on most domains, but I am specifically going to pick out the meeting domain here. This is the output of IBM Watson's speech API, which offered a diarization component as of 2017 on a short excerpt from a meeting in EMI. While the meeting domain can be quite challenging due to the large number of speak, potentially large number of speakers, a high degree, it's very interactive, there's a high degree of overlap. Sometimes, especially in AMI, the miking conditions were not ideal. This is not a particularly challenging excerpt from AMI. So basically, what decisions uh, have we uh, made? Uh, has there been any changes? I think we all have a presentation again, so we'll right. be able to do those. And, uh, Three presentations. Yeah. Yeah. So, so go first. Yeah, thank you. So at the top here, we have what would be a Oracle output and bottom the output of IBM Watson. It's clearly trying to figure out who spoke when and also equally clearly not doing a great job. So this is the background leading up to Die Hard. In 2017, there was a JSOF workshop at CMU, one of the teams of which was working on diarization and quickly became apparent during that summer that this is the situation we were in and we just really didn't know where we stood in regards to what the state of the art was which eventually led to the creation of Die Hard as a new series of speaker diarization evaluations using the familiar common task paradigm intended to address the fragmentation apparent in the research community. And the focus being here really specifically on robust diarization that is diarization resilient to variation across a wide range of dimensions, conversational domain, recording equipment, recording environment, reverberation, ambient noise, number of speakers, speaker demographics, percent speech overlap, et cetera. The first Die Hard uh, ran in 2018, spring 2018, with 13 teams competing, and the results were presented later that year at a uh, interspeech special session in Hyderabad. That's followed up one year later by Die Hard 2, which ran spring 2019. Again, uh, 21 teams competed that year with a special session at Garage used as the venue for results. And then Die Hard 2 was followed up one year later like clockwork with Die Hard 3, which ran fall 2020. Again, uh, attracted 21 teams with the results presented this past January at a standalone workshop. We've used the same task throughout each of these challenges. For each recording, uh, the system is required to determine number of speakers present. And then for each one of those speakers identified, identify all the corresponding speech segments. And this task is evaluated on two different tracks. Track one, which is diarization rization from a reference set. So in this track, systems are provided with a, a reference speech segmentation as an Oracle segmentation that is generated by merging speaker turns in the reference diarization rization. And this is intended to evaluate diarization rization performance exclusive of the SAD component. Then under a second track, track two term diarization rotation from scratch, this is really the, the more realistic condition. The system is provided with nothing but the raw audio and has to do everything on its own from scratch. We've also utilized the same um, Evaluation metric over the three challenges, uh, diarization rotation error rate, which was originally introduced by 
uh, NIST for the RTO 3S evaluation. This is just the, the total percentage of the reference speaker time that is not correctly attributed to a speaker. And by correctly attributed here, we mean under a optimal mapping between the set of system speakers and the set of reference speakers. And dollarization error rate is, is really quite analogous to error. It's uh, the sum total of false alarm, miss, and speaker confusion errors divided by the, the total reference speaker time. Typically, uh, prior to Die Hard, this was computed in a very forgiving fashion where overlap speech segments in the reference uh, diarization were discarded prior to scoring. And there was a forgiveness call for about 250 seconds that was a no-score reach on either side of any reference turn boundary. Die Hard explicitly scores overlap speech and does not use those forgiveness colors. And that again has been consistent across all three evaluations. As far as data, we have not to date distributed training data or uh, specified a designated training set. In principle, any training data is free game for participants unless it's explicitly excluded by the evaluation plan. You can use proprietary data, you can use public data. The only constraint is if you use proprietary data, you have to explain and describe in detail what is in that data set, volumes, what kinds of data, how it's annotated. In practice, most teams just use some combination of box slug and common voice, plus the development set distributed with Die Hard. Uh, we do distribute a development set that has a composition roughly equivalent to that of the evaluation set. Five to 10 minute duration recordings chosen from 13 different and diverse conversational domains. At least two hours of audio per domain. Uh, a majority of this data is manually segmented, uh, quite painfully manually segmented, to be honest. The remainder segmented in an automated fashion using forced alignment of uh, turn-level transcripts. And forced alignment is generally used, uh, that's generally reserved for corpora where we have transcripts and clean audio. As I mentioned, there are 13 domains that we have chosen from over the course of Die Hard 1, 2, and 3. These vary drastically in terms of number of speakers, environmental conditions, and just general difficulty. On one end of the spectrum, we have the most trivial. We have audiobooks, so single speaker, untrained amateur reading a public domain audiobook. Mr. Pickwick had bestowed a hasty glance on these interesting objects when he was again greeted by his faithful disciple. Then we have a variety of domains that consist of two-person interactions, but under different conditions. In the easier side of things, we have map task and broadcast interview, where you have, in the map task case, two people, two participants in a sleep deprivation study being recorded while performing a map task. You have picnic site. Picnic site? Where? No, I don't. The site of the forest fire. And broadcast interview, which consists of broadcast radio interviews from the 1970s conducted by University of Pennsylvania undergrads. Uh, it's actually quite fascinating. What type of carrots can we use on the average citizen? Proposals, for example, on various types of tax incentive schemes uh, that have been put forth that would be would. Also in the domain of two-party interactions, we have clinical interviews. Uh, and specifically, we have clinical interviews involving an adult clinician who is administering an autism diagnostic observation schedule interview to a child suspected of being somewhere on the spectrum. So these can range from the trivial. What about feeling angry? Yeah. What kinds of things make you angry? So not the best recording conditions, but also nothing particularly challenging in terms of the background. Uh, both speakers are audible. You do have to deal with child speech. But you also get things like this, where you have some rather wild modulation of the voice by the child, which is, I can tell you from experience, very difficult for speech to text or forced alignment. I really like to be happy because just how we like being. I just don't smile like all the time. I just have a little bit of problems. Yeah. <coughs> what do you mean by that? 
and we have, <coughs> excuse me, uh, social linguistic recordings, both in the lab recorded as part of Mixer 6 and in the field. Uh, most of these in the field ones are quite noisy. Uh, I'll play this one just because Bill LeBeau is on it. I know I interview with people about fishing and hunting and ranching just about everything they learn outside of school. I just say common sense. On the other end of the spectrum, I'm not going to play all of these, so you'll have to go back and check out the clips in the slides afterwards for ones I don't play. We have uh, restaurant conversations, four to seven person interactions in a restaurant around Penn's campus, highly reverberant, lots of background noise, background conversations, very, very difficult. And we have web video. These are a combination of clips sourced from YouTube and Vimeo and a combination of Mandarin and English. This is a bit of a grab bag. You have monologue, you have two person interactions, you have four or five parties. You have speech from wide, wide types of channel conditions, wide types of recording equipment. You have speech recorded in cars as people are driving. You have speech involving children with toys and TV shows playing in the background. You have speech in public. So this is just a representative example. You're all in my chair like a little star. And I'll just say, uh, this is very painful to annotate. Predictably, systems performance has improved over time. So this is a plot of the diarization error rate for the best performing system on each track for diehards one, two, and three. For track one, and back in diehard one, uh, the best system was given a diarization error rate of 23.73% which has fallen to 13.45% in Die Hard 3. And similarly, we've seen reduction in track two from 35.51% to 19.37%. So roughly 45% reduction, relative reduction. Now that figure is actually a little misleading uh, because we have seen changes to the composition of the evaluation set and to the annotation over time. Uh, for instance, in Die Hard 2, the web video and child data were both completely re annotated from scratch to deal with annotation errors present in Die Hard 1. In Die Hard 3, we actually removed the child data due to issues with the license that we just didn't want to deal with the headache of anymore. But there were five domains that had no change in the composition or annotation over time. And of those five, I selected three audiobooks, uh, Map Task, and Meeting to present here in the same way I did the previous slide. So this shows those three domains, performance on track one, and we'll ignore map task and audiobooks just because they were already near ceiling on Die Hard 1. Focus on meeting where we have about 30% relative reduction over time from Die Hard 1 to Die Hard 2. And the same figure, but for track two, for the same domains, again, roughly 30% relative reduction. And which should have been quite apparent in the last two slides, there's a lot of variation as expected by domain. Uh, this is a bit more explicit in the current slide. This presents the box plots of diarization error rate for systems in the final leaderboard per track in Die Hard 3, both overall here and per domain. And the domains are just sorted in ascending order of median diarization error rate. We have uh, one group of what do I call tractable domains, audiobooks to clinical, where diarization rhization error rate, uh, the median DER is ranging from five to 18% track one, and about 20 to 28% for track two. And then we have these other three domains, which form a group of much, much harder diarization rhization, uh, median speech, the web videos, and the restaurant conversations. And in particular, these web video and restaurant conversations are hard. For those two, we have median DR exceeding 35%, uh, actually really exceeding 
40% on track one and 55% for track two. In fact, if, we're, if I'm honest, these are domains I really, if I had known just how bad performance was when I was originally creating the diehard data set, eval set composition, I probably would have excluded them. I'm not really interested in just bludgeoning systems. Uh, I don't think that's particularly productive. It certainly does nothing for morale. We've also seen evolution in the kinds of systems that people have used over time. So the predominant architecture has been a very traditional modular diarization dynamization architecture. This is the only architecture really that was seen in uh, Die Hard 1 and 2 and still the predominant architecture in Die Hard 3. You have most of these modules would be present, but some could be absent. You might have a front end processing module before doing anything else that would take care of things like beam forming or uh, possibly supervised or unsupervised speech enhancement or dereverberation. A speech activity detection module that would produce a set of speech segments for the recording, uh, typically supervised and also typically using deep neural networks, LSTMs or TDNN networks. Uh, this might be followed by a segmentation step, but uh, the segmentation strategies used are pretty trivial, so I'm just going to ignore this for the moment. Uh, then a speaker embedding module. So this is where a lot of the heavy lifting would occur. Uh, in Die Hard 1, speaker embeddings would have been I vectors almost universally. Hopkins team did use X vectors in Die Hard 1 submission. By Die Hard 2, pretty much everybody was using some sort of neural network based uh, speaker representation, whether X vector or D vector or uh, there's a whole alphabet soup of these things. And then the speaker embedding would be followed by a clustering stage. And predominantly, the clustering has tend to be agglomerative hierarchical clustering, sometimes spectral clustering. For either agglomerative hierarchical clustering or spectral clustering, the distance would be based upon PLDA scoring. Although uh, more recently, there have been attempts to use VBHMMs for this, particularly uh, during Die Hard 2. The winning submission to each track was from Brunel University, who used a variational base HMM instead of a block of hardcore clustering at this stage. And then also sometimes you have a post-processing phase, which cleans up the output of the clustering phase. It could be a resegmentation using the Turby uh, or VBHMM. VBHMM has become quite dominant in the last two challenges. You also sometimes see system fusion where a team will produce four or five or six uh, systems in parallel and then merge their output into a single output at the end. And the general approaches here have been Dover and more recently Dover Lab. Uh, and then there's a, also, I should make mention of TSBAD, but that's not, while well, it's important, uh, I should probably gloss over that for now and just say that this was very important in the winning submission to Chime 6. More recently, as of Die Hard 3, we've also started to see end-to-end -end diarization, uh, make inroads. Starting with Die Hard 3, we saw a shift to end-to-end -end models. The winning model, the winning system for both tracks, was a conventional modular system of the kind presented in the past slide. But the second place team was a joint effort between Hopkins and Hitachi and used an end-to-end -end system based on Hitachi's end-to-end encoder-decoder-based attractor architecture. We also saw uh, more system fusion in Die Hard 3. Uh, it was present in Die Hard 2, but Die Hard 3, we really started to see a lot of it. That was also an important piece of the Hopkins Hitachi submission. So looking forward, what have we learned by doing this three times in a row, apart from the fact there aren't enough hours in the day? Uh, really aren't enough. One, diarization is still hard. Uh, if the reference speech segmentation is withheld, then for many domains, diarization, error rate still exceeds 20%. And for two domains specifically, uh, web, in particular web video and restaurant speech, it exceeds 50%. And actually, even for very well studied domains that people have been working on since 2002, such as meeting speech, I mean, meeting speech was even the focus of the NIST rich transcription evaluation series. Diarization rhization error rate when you withhold that reference speech activity detection still exceeds 35%. It's also not the case that uh, this is just because 
it's not the case that like large companies such as Google or Amazon or Apple or IBM have some sort of special sauce. Uh, they also are doing poorly. If we go back to that meeting speech example from Amy I presented earlier, the one that IBM's Watson was doing poorly on in 2017. So this is, let me just play this again really shortly. So, so basically what decisions uh, would we uh, need? Uh, again, it's not a hard snip as far as these things go and Watson is doing horribly in 2017. Fast forward four years, this is 2021. I've run the exact same clip through uh, the most recent version of the API. It's different, the output is different, but in no way can I say the output is an improvement. And, and just to be clear, I am not picking on IBM here. IBM and just happens to be one of the, the companies that happens to deploy diarization in API and makes it particularly easy to access. Google also does this, and this is Google's output as of 2021 on the exact same audio clip. It is similarly abysmal. We've also learned manual annotation of this kind at scale is simply not feasible. The domains that are hard for systems are also hard for humans, uh, even those with PhD knowledge of acoustic phonetics and speech recognition. We somewhat optimistically had originally posited we could do manual annotation of this data to very high quality at say six to eight times real time. Uh, it turns out our pilot, those were based, estimates were based on pilot experiments using data that was just too easy. When we started hitting some domains that systems had trouble on, like seedlings, the child language data, uh, the real-time annotation ROPS rates could sometimes exceed 31 times real time. And most I can tell you from having done this personally, most of this difficulty is driven by the overlap speech. It is just as hard for humans to deal with as it is machines. So annotation scale at true scale, you know, thousands of hours scale is not really feasible. Annotation to scale hot, you know, beyond what we've done in previous diehards in the order of a few dozens of hours. I, you know, it's certainly possible with funding, but it's gonna require some sort of cheating, either forced alignment using clean, well-separated audio or you know, taking advantage of multiple modalities when available, for instance, in the case of web video. It's also clear, actually, this was clear going into Die Hard, that diarization rate error rate is not the right metric, or I should say, it's we obviously it's not a perfect metric. If it, were, if it were, we would be having this discussion. It is a convenient metric like word error rate that is simple, it is easy to compute and generally applicable with the result that just lends itself readily to ranking and charting progress over time, which is important when you're trying to run a challenge and demonstrate that as a result of a program or funding or some other intervention that you are getting an improvement. But it doesn't gracefully handle scoring of overlap speech. Uh, it's, in, I feel, unnecessarily punitive there, especially given how difficult that is for humans to deal with. And more importantly, it is not at all clear that improvements to DER on the challenge materials correlate with improvements in real world diarization performance, even on what should be the same domain. Uh, as a case in point, take meeting scenario. We saw a 30% or so relative reduction in diarization rotation error rate on that domain within the challenge over three, from diehard one to diehard three. Over the same period of time, going from 2017 to 2021, we've seen no noticeable improvement in the quality of diarization rotation output from actual commercially deployed systems on such materials. Probably, almost certainly what we should be doing is actually measuring the impact of diarization for a downstream task like speech uh, to text, which is actually what Chime 6 did. And to try to end on a positive note, there certainly seems to be, there certainly is a lot of interest and potentially money to allow continued work in this area. If we just look at Die Hard, we saw the number of competing teams rise from 13 to 21 from the span of three years. Uh, 21 teams from 30 sites, I should add. And participation would actually have been, I think, quite a bit higher if it were not for the combination of Die Hard 3 being run during COVID, which depressed pretty much all challenges I'm aware of. Uh, and also the fact that we were unable to allow some Chinese teams to compete uh, due to State Department uh, stipulations. We also, I'm also pleased to say that diarization is now included in multiple other challenges, 
all actually using the same evaluation procedure as Die Hard, so at least there's some consistency. Chime 6 has looked at diarization within the context of dinner parties and multi-channel distant speech. Fearless Steps has looked at massively multi-channel on the order of dozens of channels, data from the Apollo 11 mission. Uh, Box Sister C is considered the diarization of YouTube videos, a, a different, more restricted domain of YouTube videos that we've considered. These are YouTube videos involving interviews and oftentimes have uh, are well designed for this kind of scenario. But it's a, we have maybe two and a half hours of YouTube videos in our dev set and our two half of the eval and they have on the order of 40 hours. So it's certainly a much more in-depth examination in that particular domain. And finally, uh, I'll just touch really briefly on some of our future plans. Uh, there will not be a diehard for in 2021. Putting aside the fact we're simply have been a little burnt out, we really have been using 2021 to deal with accumulated technical debt from Die Hard 1, 2, and 3, and to produce some overdue retrospective analysis, in particular, an overdue journal article. There will be a return in 2022. Uh, Die Hard will return with a new data set, with a new task specification, and this is going to be negotiated jointly with the community. And if you're interested in updates on any of this or just contributing, please just sign up for the mailing list, uh, which is listed below right here, or contact me directly. Uh, thank you. And also, I'd like to thank Ken for organizing this workshop and giving us a venue to discuss these important issues. And again, uh, thank you, everybody, for hanging in there. <laughs>